started. Um, I'm Peter, uh, the president of the Red State Village Association. Yay! <laughs> Fern is not the president. And Yay! <laughs> Who made the cookies? That's what I want to know. Uh, <laughs> Sue, Sue keeps running out of the room. Um, I, did, I did some of them, but Sue did most of them. Uh, Sue, who's the cookie master and the woman who's the, the, the big force behind our garden uh, out by the high school. Yay! Yeah. 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 One of the greatest yeah. symbols of the village. The garden sure. has been gorgeous. That's beautiful. Yeah. I, I know. And she does yeah. the garden in front of this building, which is beautiful. That's true, too. The garden in front of this building yeah. um, has also been Sue and, and her folks who help her out. Yeah, and her, the other person. Um, with all of the mayor debates and uh, the other political things going on, um, we thought, like a month and a half ago, that um, we should be hearing from David as well. Uh, <laughs> you are going to be our city councilor for another term. Um, and uh, so uh, we look forward to that and wanted to get an opportunity for people to come in and talk about the issues that are out there uh, and hear from David about what he's looking at coming up um, down the road and how he's how you're responding to the stuff that's going on. Um, we also have the North Street Village Association here today. Uh, recording our proceedings. Um, if you, if you, Emily, who's behind the camera, if you're ever um, looking for uh, stuff about the city, one of the places to go is the North Street Village Association website, and you can see uh, video footage of all kinds of stuff. Uh, all about lots of different meetings that go on. I thought, seeing we're kind of an intimate group, we do a couple things. One would be go around and introduce ourselves. Um, also. I did not come with a whole bunch of prepared questions, but did come with some various topic areas, but we want to make sure everybody gets a chance to make sure that whatever it is that you're interested in uh, gets, gets voiced um, this evening. And uh, feel free to jump up and get cream and cookies and stuff while we're here as well. Um, so perhaps we first go around and say, say who we are. We start with this guy and go this way. And we'll I'm Vern Fath. I uh, participate in the um, Bay State Village Association and wherever where I can. I guess most of it lately has been the, my um, participation in the traffic committee. So uh, He's responsible for that, that speed bump up in the front of the street. Well, I'm well, responsible, but I had a hand <laughs> <laughs> And I, I kind of like it. Uh, yeah. Uh, it is really slow the traffic down. I can actually get out of my driveway without fear of being run over. That's right. Hearn is also the the going force behind the bike finance we've had the last two years mm -hmm. uh, down at um, at Mainsfield, which is the part of the traffic committee project. Right. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm Mark Warner, and, and actually there was one thing that I, I did want to go and, and hear from you tonight, and that was a, the vote a year or so ago when you were one of the three councillors who voted saying, look, we, we should not forego any landfill expansion until we find out what the other costs and benefits are of the alternatives. And I think that was the right decision, but I'm looking to get a further understanding of what did the council know at that time, and why didn't the other six? also choose to understand what the costs and benefits were of the alternatives and what you think the costs are going to be, uh, whatever the alternatives might be, if we do in fact close the landfill. All right. Well, let me let everybody introduce themselves and then I'll okay. answer Yeah, them. I know. That's yeah, what the first time. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, I'm Gladys Powers. I live across from Sue on Winslow, and I'm sort of a passive observer. <laughs> okay. I'm Pat Schumann. I live on Hinkley Street with my husband Tom and a couple of cats and um, you mean my the, grandkids. Uh, um, Apple Preservation District? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the exact spot. <laughs> Where we're starting another one. <laughs> one coming out in front of us. So. But I'd like to be more involved. Oh, in, uh, <laughs> I've been out there digging on that hole. Oh, yeah. Get on the traffic. <laughs> <Or again. you. laughs> We can help. <laughs> yeah, 
Right. I'm Susan DeMarie. I'm on 147 Riverside, and I really like the speed bumps because I can't get out of my driveway. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Shaughnessy on top of the hill, uh, Liberty Street. Um, I'm Nancy Murphy, retired. I play. I knit. <laughs> <laughs> I quilt. I book rugs. Oh, and there's a board and play in the house. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so she's introduced me and gave me my run now. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I'm Gordon Murphy and I clean the house. <laughs> and try to stay out of David's hair. <laughs> All right. So we'll do, we're going to do Mark's question. Sure. Why did they do that? Because they haven't really 
ever answered the question. You know, my they're colleagues have never answered the question to me. They're continuing. All they'll say when they get one of these candidates, when somebody asks at a debate, they'll well, say, they'll say, well, like Michael Barnes, his his mantra is increased recycling. Well, of course you've got to increase recycling. But my, Michael That's was not very involved in the putting that question together. I mean, it was a very it was very much an issue that he was involved with putting that question together and making that happen. You know, essentially, my perspective is the landfill question got hijacked by about 20 people, very successfully. On Glendale Road. But yeah, very successfully. And uh, they, they basically hijacked the issue and got the outcome they were looking for. And I didn't really agree with that because I thought it was a really important, complex, and financial question for the city. And it should, be, it should have been looked at with the well-being of the entire city in mind. And that didn't happen. So. I was on the EPW at the time that this was all argued out. And there was a lot of studies done and looked at about what the alternative was. And I, th I think that the city, both the BPW, even though I think it really ended up in the, in the, the only ch change that could possibly have happened was through the city council because of the referendum. But I think that the, um, the city, everybody is skirting around an issue that's going to become a major crisis mm -hmm. if it's not dealt with soon. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the expectation like, is. Like, trash going to go? Exactly. And how is it going to cost? It's going to cost us money. Options. It's going to cost money. I mean, I think the studies are out there. They're done. It shows we're going to be paying more for trash. With no, once, it, once it was decided that the landfill was going to close, if that stays that way, then the trash costs are going up. Peter, you want and to? I think that somebody has to be responsible, and ultimately, I do believe that the city council. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, maybe yeah. they have to work together. Um, I, don't I know agree with you, but, and, and that's why I voted, you know, against just make, you know pretending it went away. But uh, you know, the majority of people yeah. said, "Let's get rid of this." So, so I guess my question is: so, what what steps are going to be taken? Um, th those at this point, it's sort of been thrown back to the Department of Public Works to come up with how they want to deal with it, if they want to deal with it. I mean, the city could say, we don't want to be in the trash business, God bless you, call the private caller, do whatever you want to do. I mean, it's not, you know, it isn't a function we're required to provide. So they could just say, well, we don't even, you know, fine, you want us out of the trash business, we're out of the trash business. Um, I think that would be hard on people. I mean, yeah. the Duso family, you know, bought a piece of property and opened up a private center on, on Route 10 to provide that service, but it really is, you know, it's it's public public works bailiwick now to deal with it, and and as I said, I was very disappointed when the council voted to just basically not deal with the issue and, and say no, and and it was done by ordinance. They simply created an ordinance that said that they you couldn't operate a landfill anymore in that location once this will close, but it is only a, an ordinance. I mean, we could make the ordinance go away and go back to landfill business if we wanted to. Uh, if the council had to resolve to do that, but they just sort of said, no, let's dispose of this, get it off our plate, and move on. Peter, you have to, yeah, yeah, I talked to Mayor Higgins mm -hmm. uh, probably four years ago about this, mm -hmm. and she was talking about modeling and the, and the bladder and all this. Talking about there, what? The, the landfill. Why, there, why the reasons for, the, for closing were legitimate or not legitimate, or were not. Legitimate. And she cited modeling, and we all know, at least I do, that modeling doesn't actually duplicate reality. And in a problem where you had that sort of stuff over at Aquifer, once it's done, it's done. You can't you can't reclaim the water. The water is, is forever gone. So I thought the science involved with the issue, forget how it was worded or whatever, was a good, was basic. All right, yes, we're gonna have to pay more. But that's gonna become a reality for lots of communities. And the way we're doing it now it doesn't even make sense, not to me anyway. So that's done. So where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. We should be looking at the alternatives yeah. now and dealing with rather than going back and pointing fingers at why or why not. I thought the science was very found in the beginning of why or the aquifer. And if that gets into the aquifer, then you can't mm -hmm. reclaim it. Mm -hmm. Cape Cod will tell you that. Yeah. And they've got that same problem in their aquifer. It's done. <clears throat> so at, at any rate, I, I'm a real fan of their there are different boards, committees, commissions, and entities in the city that have specific responsibilities. And this one is Public Works. And they are, they are an independent entity. And, and you know, the, the, the largest one's Public Works and the school committee. And we have our job to do, and they have their jobs to do. They're independent. You know, they have their, their own, but they have 
control over their own budget, they have control over what they do and how they do it to a great extent. We have control over their overall budget and their borrowing, but not their day-to-day -day operation. And so it's really in, in their court and their responsibility to deal with. So that, that's what they're doing. And I, I really don't want to, yeah, I feel it would be inappropriate to get involved in what I think they should do. I mean, it's their job to do and they should do it. And well, who makes it do it? Yeah, right. Is it, how are schools holding them accountable? Mm -hmm. Is it the city council that's holding them Or is it the mayor? Um, well, the mayor, the mayor, we, we did a charter change, I think before I was on the council, or just before, that gave the, the mayor authority over appointing their director, because that used to be a, the public, the board used to pick who their, their, their director was. Um, so the mayor now does that. But really the council, all we do is uh, we <coughs> overall budget with them and we do borrowing. You know, if they want to borrow money, um, that they, got, they have to come to the council for that. But otherwise, you know, they have a meeting, they, you know, their board meets, you know, folks can go to it and, and talk directly to them about what they want to do. Uh, Jim Dostal went from the council after his surgery, he went back to public work, so he's back there again. Uh, but they're, they're the ones that are tasked with coming up with a plan, and I'm you know, looking forward to see what they come up to, but I really don't want to do their job for them. I'm happy, once they come up and say, here's what we'd like to do, I'm happy to comment on it, but I really don't want to get involved and, and muck up their process. But they should do that. I mean, they know they should do that. And now, still a joint committee? There, yeah, there is a joint committee of the city council. There's a couple city councilors that meet with uh, public works folks. And I think um, now that Paul, Paul Spector is on that committee, I don't know the other member. So there's still a joint committee. And again, that committee has no authority to bind either the council or the public works board. They just, you know, they can work out issues so that there's a couple councilors. If public works is coming, there's a couple councilors that can come in and say, yeah, we talked about this and this is the proposal we have for you. But it doesn't have any independent authority, just sort of a working group to help the two. We have one with the school committee, you know, there's one that, between the city council and the school committee. And we're required to meet with the school committee once a year. Though, the only control we have over the schools is the total lump sum budget amount we give to them, and then any borrowing they do. How they spend the money they get is their decision. We don't, we were not involved in that. So, you know, they, we, they get X number of dollars out of the city budget. And it's up to them how they spend it. And, and we have one joint meeting with them. But, but the they have a lot of the mayor is chairman. The mayor chairs at this point both the council and the uh, and the school committee. So the mayor's involvement. The mayor even there only has one vote. And I think uh, the ward five school committee member is the vice chair. I believe so. Yeah, she she chairs that when the mayor is there. Is. Yeah, and so she's very involved. But what they spend and where they spend and their contracts and so forth are done with you know the school committee uh, with personnel the mayor's involved in that but the city council really isn't besides voting the overall budget to them and working on borrowing they may want to do what they do and how they do it and how they spend their money is totally done by them we don't have any input into that we meet with them once a year uh, but that's usually just in budget season when they present their budget but the only say so we have over the budget is a total amount. And all we can do is cut it because the mayor determines what goes where. And all we can do is cut, we can't add. Which is well, really that's makes. Always, that's always true. That, that's, that's true under our charter. So we go there, but all we can do is say, you know, let's give them less money, which yeah. usually people don't want to do. So that's all the control we have over them. They well, spend more money than we do. You that's know? cool. Oh yeah, the, the school is the largest budget in the city, and they have control over that, we don't. Right. So they actually, the school committee has more line item spending authority than the city council has when you get right down to it. But they're the largest employer too. Those in the city, yeah. Although the one thing you should know about their budget is their benefits are on the city side. So when you see their budget, it doesn't reflect the ben their benefits. The benefits are all on our side. So. In fact, the portion of the budget that is directly attributed to the schools is larger than it may appear because we have we have their benefits. How did you get from the dump to the school? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're just talking about how, oh, okay. 
how you know, and it was one of Peter's uh, major categories. So I figured we did talk. We did have the school budget on, on the list. Yes, but I was I was thinking of maybe what I heard more than anything going around the circle was traffic calming, mm -hmm. and um, it's clear that three years ago was when we did do our traffic calming request. Wait, so just before we change this, uh, yeah. do I understand about the dump that that we're just going to have to wait till the DPW. Uh, decides on which option, uh, where they're going to, uh, some place in New York State or in Vermont or somewhere where they're going to that, haul the stuff, and then they have to um, uh, arrange for the, all the pickups and mm -hmm. the, the, the trucking and everything mm -hmm. and the cost of doing So they're going to decide that. exactly how they're going to administer that. And they just report to you that they picked This the is the proposal that we want to go forward with. And, and so you don't, and, and the city council doesn't have any say as to whether they feel that this is a, a decision. A not, not really. It's really their decision to make, remembering that they don't have to do anything at all. They could just say, you know, we want out of the trash business. God bless you citizens, you know. So what would that mean? Each Wait. person then has to... Quiet. <laughs> Didn't the DBW do a survey several months ago now? Yeah. And the yeah. discussion was keeping the transfer stations yeah. open, yeah. which one open, open, and, which and probably open. keeping an eye on further further outreach pieces that the DPW does mm -hmm. is something that, that we should try and really keep on top of. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and some of the other things they've spoken about, I mean, we've talked about with them um, taking custody of the old state property that's located right next to them yeah. and turning you know potentially turning that into a transfer station and a swap yeah, place a for place. you know people love picking tra other people's trash so just, and it's hard to do you know in it's hard to do in their yard because in addition to people dropping off their trash there's front loaders and big trucks and things driving around and it isn't really conducive to people walking around picking through trash so we've talked about securing that property and capital improvements we've talked about securing that property and actually whatever DPW decides to do with trash collection recycle whatever move it down there so it's out of the traffic pattern in their yard and give it its own special location and we have you know we have in capital improvements worked on putting the money aside to be able to make that deal with the state to get that property the building needs to be demolished but it would be another it would be right next yeah, to their main location, safe. but it would be a, another place that would be a lot safer. You could, yeah. you know, there'd be more parking, and you wouldn't have to dodge front loaders when you're when you're trying to do your recycling or, or turn your trash in. So, to th that's the kind of discussion that we have with them if they need us to secure property like that for them, but not the nitty gritty of, you know, you'll use this color bag and put this kind of, <laughs> and it'll cost this much, and that's that's well, the thanks for reading that. Up. Yeah, that's. that's <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. I one is um, that I'm not, I, I was not opposed to the dump being closed mm -hmm. because even though Michael Bard said his comment we need to get out of the mm -hmm. garbage business and into the recycling business, I tend to agree with that philosophy, but I thought the, the whole decision was rushed and was not thought through well enough. Okay, but as far as the city's job of, of supplying us a, a route for our garbage. I think that's kind of in the same line as uh, supplying water and supplying sewage. You know, mm -hmm. you, you got the incoming and you got the outgoing, and where is this stuff going to go? And if you just leave it to private contractors, then you have the problem of, well, when are they going to start jacking the prices up when, they, when we don't have any more options and things mm -hmm. like that. So I personally think having the, the DPW or, or the city, if it were, who was in charge of that, a, a reasonable approach to the, the problem. But. And there is, you know, those other, the water, the sewer, and their enterprise funds. And we have a solid waste enterprise fund, which to this point has been sort of tied to the operation of the landfill. But that certainly could stick around for the purposes of doing whatever they choose to do with it, to run their recycling center and their, and, and, uh, their transfer station where they sort the stuff and, and ship it off to wherever they ship it off to. Well, let's, let's move on from trash. <laughs> um, uh, the, the traffic calming requests went in. Now we have temporary speed humps on Riverside Drive. Um, there's a number of other elements identified as dangerous intersections and such. It's clear that there's a diversity of opinion about these speed humps on Riverside Drive. Um, and so I was just curious to know if, uh, if 
your thoughts on the, the process, perhaps, <coughs> or um, uh, if you've driven, driven up and down or slightly Oh, I drive, I drive, drive. <laughs> Driven, drive over them because when I take my dogs for a walk in the morning, I come back down Riverside Drive. Um, the ones that are there will be going away for the winter, you know, because they can't leave the temporary ones out when they plow. The last, um, there was a meeting last week of or parking transportation committee, which is the one that administers the traffic coming there, where this goes. And it was my understanding from that meeting, and there was public comment from from Bay State at that meeting, that the message they got from that public comment was uh, not to put permanent ones in. Now, I don't know, I don't know. I, I was at the meeting and yeah. that there were two people who spoke to that and, and a couple who spoke yeah. to So I was not at the meeting, but it was my understanding that what came from it was the fact that the, the temporary ones have to leave because of the winter. And that at this point they weren't planning on putting permanent ones in based on the theme, on the feedback they got. And everybody that sent me an email, I forwarded to them so that Maureen, Councillor Carney from Ward 1 chairs that group. And if you've never been there, it, it's actually a large and relatively powerful committee. Uh, the DPW director's there, the traffic engineer's there, the police chief's there, the planner's there. Uh, there's somebody that represents public traffic. I mean, it's a big group, a very big group. with movers and shakers. Yeah, uh, and, 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 and my understanding from a conversation with the police chief, and I checked it with him this evening before I came here, was that they weren't planning on putting permanent ones in because they felt that the neighborhood really didn't want them. Oh, so, from what? No, what kind of from comments at, at, from emails and comments oh, at the meeting. Too. I think it was last Tuesday, or was it, it was last Tuesday? Tuesday afternoon. Yeah. yeah. We can go. Yeah. So. Um, obviously, they weren't going to put permanent ones in this fall anyway, because it's getting sort of near the end of the season, you can do asphalt things. So, if that is not the outcome you want, please communicate with me and I will send those communications to Maureen Carney, who chairs that committee. In fact, I sent them to, to Dave, David, you know, the acting mayor, and to Maureen, and I think they did bring them to the meeting, because uh, I saw feedback from Maureen to the people that I'd sent emails along to her from about that. So um, nothing's going to happen, you know, between now and winter anyway, but there was time to convince them that wasn't the right decision, but I think that's the decision they made. They've been installed in Jackson Street? Yes. yes. And with the same process in place for that, or did they just... No, they, they, they did it on Jackson Street when they redid the street, yes, but that's when they put them in. But yeah, there was a similar process through transportation. And the neighborhood the decided they wanted to. Yes, I guess they did. Dude. Not my neighborhood, so I don't know. Not my neighborhood. It seems that, that that particular problem is federal funds to do that, that whole area. It is. The Jackson Street thing was a little different. Mm -hmm. Grove Street yes. is more parallel to our yes. situation. That's why I asked about Jackson and Grove and Street. Grove Street. Well, they had funding. Well, and, and they had funding on Grove Street, too, because yeah. I think that was state hospital money. For Grove Street, you know, they did those nice little brick intersections. So that was that was state hospital funding. But this, I don't think the speed humps are not that expensive to do. I think they, the feedback I got was that there wasn't a clear consensus that they were really wanted by the neighborhood, and some speak, people spoke profoundly against them. So if you don't feel that is the case and you want them, communicate with me, and I'll pass that along. Well, Usually, you get the people that don't want something. Mm -hmm. And the people that are satisfied mm -hmm. yeah, don't say anything. Yeah, right. Which is why you have an opportunity now to chime up, send me an email, and I'll forward them to Maureen because there's nothing, they, they weren't going to happen until springtime, anyways, if they're going to happen when they go back into their paving mode. So there's time because they could decide the other way, and you could have some activity when it was going to happen, if it was going to happen anyway. So, but be aware, at this point, they're thinking you don't really want them. So if you do, Send something along. Uh, part of the problem with those speed hops is, <laughs> and these are worse than the tables that are. That's right. right. They, these are not indicative of what the real speed yeah. humps would be because they they're much more abrupt. They're they're, mm. they're noisier and things like that. They yeah. move around. Yeah, the Jackson the Jackson Street ones. Jackson there. Street would be more. Yeah. Faster. Yeah. But even there's variability in those too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I'll I'll just to supplement what you're saying too. There is a meeting here. 
didn't bring the date today, but I can figure it out. Uh, in early November, after the election, uh, Laura Hansen is coming, who is the traffic engineer on the 14th. We're going to meet here again, and we'll get some lighting or something out front so people can find the place. Um, and she, I don't know if she will have the results of the traffic study. They've done a traffic study now as well, which will have monitored the volume of traffic and speed of traffic. Um, so she may have the results from that, and that's a public forum where she's looking for input. Um, she's one of the conduits who, of course, sits on the Transportation Commission. Um, I was at the meeting, I got up, I spoke saying that they uh, are, um, uh, I spoke pretty neutrally actually, They're looking forward to what, was, what would be said. But there were people, there were a couple people there who, who felt the noise uh, and the backup of traffic were, were very inconvenient to them. And uh, I don't know if the live right there where yeah. the I don't know are. if the minutes are on the website yet, but they will be on the website on the city website, so they're available for folks. I didn't say to see how many uh, how many emails have come through, uh, but there's there's should be hopefully there's more yeah. opportunity. Okay, because they they haven't signed yet, I don't think. But they're yeah, the, kind of swaying. What, what was <laughs> yeah, again? What was mentioned to me and what you, if you want to react to this sense okay. of information it was that they probably weren't going to go forward with them because they didn't feel it was sufficient support and people actually spoke against them. Yeah. But again, there's nothing they were going to do this fall anyway, so there's time to, to add additional input if you want to. The original placement of the bumps was, was different than where they actually put them. They had established a sign down, down closer to here and then farther down, which I thought was perfect because as people came around, yeah. they got the first one, and then they had about an equal speed, and then came to the next one, instead of some of them both of the school. Now, there's three things. There's speed bumps, there's speed humps, and there's another one that's calculated. Table. Table. Table, exactly. Thank you. That is calculated to modulate how a vehicle goes over it, and they give you a totally different experience, but they still moderate the traffic. And I think, oops, I think that the, the, the tables mm -hmm. may be more in line mm -hmm. with what we want than the speed humps. The table would be what the humps, humps, humps and all the tables. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but I, that, again, Laura, if you've got Laura Hansen coming here on the 14th, she's the real expert on it. She's very nice. She's very responsive. She's a great person. Um, and she'd be the one to talk to about it. She would. She's a member of that body. She could take your opinions right back. So definitely come and see her because she's very nice. I'll just mention too, having the insight, why those humps got moved yeah. was Laura's attempt was speaking with uh, butters, uh, people that would have been right beside the humps, about putting them in and having some resistance from folks, saying they didn't want one in front of their house. So it wasn't so much science that drove that as, uh, as public input. Uh, by the way, so, have, have you received a lot of emails about this? And I would say, well, I got no away. more than no more than a half a dozen, and I sent them right along to Maureen, who's the chair of that committee, so they'd have that input. And were they weighing one way or the other? Like they're about they're about split. People that liked them, people that didn't like them. The people that didn't like them really didn't like them. Some people slow dancing about 10 miles an hour, and then somebody else that's going 30 or 40 gets up really close to them, and then somebody else is somebody else. If, however, mm -hmm. they're going at the speed limit, and they're all going over at the same time, mm -hmm. they're not going to have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. You really, those things, you really have to go over 20 miles an hour. Yeah. Yeah. That's slower than those, because yeah. the, 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 the Jackson Street ones, you can do 30 over you, you, you can go reasonably quickly over those, whatever the speed limit is. But these things, you have to slow way down. A truck going over these will throw something out of the back if they're going to. Yeah, yeah these, are, these are extreme. Glad that you're trying to get a Jackson yeah. Street. Uh, oh. The limit is 20 miles an hour because of the school. Well, it's, it, is, During school. it is when yeah, school is going. Yeah, it's, it's, it's faster except when, school, yeah. when the school signals are on. Then it's 20, but, it, you know, on a, all right, I, I just want to know, if you're, if you're going to be discussing this at the November meeting, are you going to have written notices of that meeting sent out? Because that would be a good idea. Oh opportunity. gosh, it was in the newsletter. We've, it was we've the circulated newsletter. things yeah, so. uh, about it. Uh, we should put, we should put it on a radio or something. Mm -hmm. that, you Please know. tell your neighbors, I'll, I'll your friends, and get some, some people here to, to discuss this in a, in a, rather than just a handful of people who yeah. might or might not yeah. like yeah. it. You know, we just have a if they know there's going to be a final decision made on this sometime this year. Um, and if you if you want to get additional emails, um, then uh, if, if you're not getting base statement of email, 
uh, write your email down on this. And because um, that notice goes out there too. Yeah. So, but um, just back to that meeting, much more effective than myself is Laura, because that's really what she does, and she's on that committee. So anything you say to her will get back to that committee. That's very kind of the path I've been working yeah. on. Laura's very good. She's very good to get that mm -hmm. there. Yeah. <laughs> and it is actually very nice to see a process where they're here now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been a long time coming, but but um, mm -hmm. we've you know we did the application things and all that, and we don't have anything happening in our area that's giving us all of a sudden some available monies, which tends to be what happens in some of the areas where these things, where the bumps show up. So we'll see how that part of the process goes. But speaking of money, mm -hmm. um, there is a question on, on the CPA coming up uh, about, um, about stopping not having a CPA in the, in the city any longer. So uh, I thought we should spend some time on that and wonder what you thought in terms of, has this been? A success, not a success, five years that we've had it, right? Um, and where you're saying it, 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 it came in when I did, because it was on the same ballot, oh, that it? initial ballot, um, when I ran the first time, the question was on that ballot. And I supported it then, and at that point in time, um, you got a complete match from the state. Yes. Whatever we raised, they matched it entirely. Now that match is now down to about 26% or something, 20, between 26 and 27. 34 cents. <laughs> yeah, so it's way, it's way down, because they'll do, the first match is, I think, the first time around they'll give you 26, almost 27, and then there'll be an additional distribution. So we'll ultimately, at some point, uh, if you can trust the state, get up into the 30s somewhere, but that has changed. And I'll tell you what I've heard about it from the people who are interested in the question. And I have no problem with the question, because it's barely passed. You know, I have no question with asking the public, do you still want this? Because it was a very close vote. I, I, and Ward 5 supported it very closely. And citywide, it passed very closely. And it took Ward 2, around the college, to put over the top, because until they came in, it was losing. Hmm. And they, they voted overwhelmingly in favor of it. And I found that interesting, because they have some of the highest tax bills in the city. You know, the property values around Smith are very high, so um, they put it over the top. I feel in the beginning, a lot of the projects they funded were real home runs, and I think a lot of people said, you know, those are great things, the library, this, that. But as it's gone on, I've heard a lot of comment from people that, gee, are they spending money just because they have it, the quality of the projects have gone down a little bit, they funded some things, you know, longer things are around. You do end up funding things that some people like more than other people. Um, I'm not in favor of it going away uh, because I still think it makes a meaningful contribution. You could have got me to bite at the concept that maybe we should have reduced the percentage a little bit. You know, the state match has gone way down. We're not getting matched dollar for dollar. You might have gotten me to say, well, yeah, maybe we should reduce the match a little because the economy isn't good. We were, the economy was booming in 2005. It's not booming now. So people are a little tighter on money. And I, I might have been convinced that, you know, we should reduce the percentage, release, you know, relieve the burden a little bit in a worse economy. But it, it cannot go away altogether because some of the money has been leveraged. They've made commitments to borrow money. So there's going to have to be enough of a CPA to cover the, the commitments they've made where they've borrowed money. So, and the state law says that. You can't get rid of it if, in fact, there's money leveraged and you have to make the payments on that money. So... Even if we voted down to vote to get rid of it, it's not going to go away altogether until the leveraged portion of it actually is completely paid out. So I'm not in favor of it going away. So I'm not supporting the, you know, and, and by the way, the question is, should we get rid of it? So a yes vote is to get rid of it. A no vote is to keep it. So make sure you pay attention Who to that. Writes these well, God bless it. You can always blame someone at the state. The Secretary of State's <laughs> office said the question has to basically be like the reverse of the question you did five years ago, is my understanding. So the question is, shall we repeal it? So yes means repeal it. No means keep it. So make sure whatever you want to vote, you know, the, this shouldn't be like a Chad thing like they had in Florida. Make sure you look at it to make sure you vote the right way. Because in this case, no is keep it and yes is get rid of it. So make sure whatever your wish is, 
you do the right thing. Peter, yeah. Yeah, I, I, the part I, I looked at your five year, or the five, the five year yeah. report, and, and the thing that struck, stuck, really struck me was the 2010 leveraging of funds. Actually, you're spending money you don't have mm -hmm. because you commit, you have $1 million, you take the $1 million and say, oh, let's go on a $10 million project, so we got to pay mm -hmm. for it down the road. Mm -hmm. How can you possibly, it, I don't think that was ever conceived one, of when people say, one, yeah, one of the things they do is they, they provide local matches or seed money. So some of the time when they say they're leveraging, they're putting them, like a couple of the projects that I voted, you know, the city council has to, they approve them. Then they go to the mayor, the mayor approves them. Then they come up to us and we approve them. And at any one of those stops, a particular project can get derailed. And the ones that I generally voted against were two of the Valley CDC's housing ones, you know, because they were spending an outrageous amount of money on a limited number of units. We were putting in $200,000, $225,000 of a $2 million project. So we weren't state, you know, we were the local match we were giving them. But, my, you know, my feeling has always been, it doesn't, it's all your money, it's all tax money. It doesn't matter whether the state took it and gives it to the project, the feds took it and gave it to the project, or we do. It's all public money. And I guess it's my feeling that you'll never solve the homelessness problem with a $240,000 single room. You've you got to get more bang for your buck or you're never really going to effectively solve homelessness because it's too big a problem to be able to solve one $240,000 room at a time. Um, you know, those, by the way, passed with my objection, so they're, they're funded. But that, when often when they say how much we leveraged, they're going to say we did, we did $2 million worth of good for $225,000. So be careful when you look at their leveraging, because it isn't always our money. It's how much money with all of the matches, like what they did with the bean farm. They got a lot of money from out of town for that, or Turkey Hill, they got a lot of money from out of town for that. So they're going to take the total project cost, even if they put up 10%, and say, look at all the money we brought into Northampton with only a small seed. Um, which, you know, it, uh, uh, it is nice to get money from uh, other sources. It's just you can't lose track of the fact that the other sources is still you, whether it's this pocket or this pocket. But Sachs Lehman have the same kind of philosophy. Let's leverage what we have. Let's bundle that money we don't have and spend it into the future. And we know what happened with that. Mm -hmm. I hadn't known about that bond uh, commitment that they were making there, but is, is that really uh, related to the to the, the in continuing revenue? Or at this point, if it was the bonds were sold based on the continued tax revenue coming in uh, from the CPA funds, who was the, who put together the prospectus, or who's re responsible here? If the wouldn't the buyer of those bonds now have to recognize that the, the city could repeal the CPA? Isn't, isn't this now just a risk of the well, investor? The, if, if, the, if the local committee and, and the, the applicants are the ones that you know, put together the entire funding package. So in the case of Valley CDC, they put together the total funding package and they get money from the state and they get money from the feds and they get money from here, there and everywhere. And we give, in those cases, uh, that was our that was our local match to that project. Cash. Yeah, that was direct cash to them for that portion of the money, um, and that and that project like that generates income. In fact, there was a commercial rental space on the first floor of that, in addition to those rooms, which a lot of people didn't know. Uh, like there is in Florence, the the building where Cup and Top is and the apothecary are. That's a similar project that Valley CDC did and has two commercial spaces in it and. A lot of that was because people in Florence said, hey, we want commercial spaces on the ground floor here. We don't want residences, we want businesses. So they did the rooms upstairs and they did two commercial spaces on the first floor. But the, most of the time, the, the commitment, if the local CPC group says, we're going to give you X amount of dollars over so many years, you know, we're going to give you a million dollars, but we're going to give you $200,000 a year for 10 years. That's their kind of their version of leveraging. They don't get involved in actual, the, 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 the applicant would get involved in the bonding. Uh, for instance, they gave money to the library and it was part of a, a bonding thing. The city treasurer on behalf of the library would do the bonding, we do the bonding. But they would say, here's the amount of money we're giving towards that. So really, it's, it's their commitment for long-term stuff. Uh, 
that would set up a scenario where CPC would not go away, even if you voted it to go away, until their ongoing commitments were fulfilled. And then it would go away. How many years are we talking about? I, I, I have no idea given this. You know, the total, if you read the, the report, you, it might have been in there. But if, if it gets voted down, there will obviously be a report made that, okay, you know, it's going away except for this, this, and this, which they've committed to, which has to continue to be funded. And there's still more money there. You know, they, they still have more money because they, the, they have to give at least 10% a year to the five primary, or four primary ones, yeah, it's... Uh, Recreation and open space, affordable housing, historic preservation, and what was it? The, the, uh, the fourth one. Recreation. Recreation. Preservation. Historic conservation. Preservation. Or something. And, yeah. Uh, but those. Away from housing. Yeah. yeah. Housing. Yeah. And open space. Affordable housing. Yeah. Open space. So, oh, so they they have to give at least ten percent a year to each of those, but they can not give out all their money in favor of you know they do different rounds of funding, so they still have money. So even if we vote it down, they can just you know dispense with the money they have uh, and spend that. They just they won't be able to you know won't show up yeah, in your no. tax bill well, except for the whatever ongoing commitments they make. Pardon me. Yeah. Um, the regardless of whether the money is from the Fed, it's our money, yeah. like you say. But if we don't have the Community Preservation Act, there's no option to get that money back from the Fed. No, the Feds will give it to somebody. That's right. It's already gone. So we us. might as well invest a little bit to get a, little, a bit more back. And basically, this money is spent here, and and we get matching funds regardless of it's not the bigger percentage, but we still get more. It's like when you're investing in your 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 retirement program and your company matches funds, well, you'd be a fool not to to, mm -hmm. look, to get some money back from it. You but, know, but, but you certainly would, depending on the amount of your employer's match, that would lead to a decision how much money you wanted to put up. Sure. You know, if they were matching at 50, you know, 100% match, and all of a sudden they decided to match at 30%, you might say, well, yeah, maybe I'm not going to put as much money into my retirement account if sure. the match goes down. Um, but remember, the reason this got created was, and a lot of it goes back to the impact of Proposition 2.5. When Proposition 2.5 got started in 1980, um, a 2.5% levy growth might have been totally realistic. You know, that a city or town with 2.5% growth of its levy every year, you know, it, it kept you within your means, but it, you know, it worked okay for a while. But when you look at from 1980 to now, what happened to health care costs alone, you know, benefits and retirements and so forth, it kind of got out of whack, so cities and towns didn't have enough money to do you know the kind of enrichment things that CPC does, like historic preservation, affordable housing, you know, open it's space, space, recreation. <laughs> those are the ones. So there wasn't enough money left over after you know thirty or something years of this. So they created CPC so there'd be another resource to get money outside and around Proposition Two and a Half to do those sort of enrichment things. And but it was up to the communities, and a lot of them. A lot of them voted in, which is why the match went down. And then the match money, if you recall, comes from a deed stamp excise tax on real estate property transfers. Well, since 2009, the real estate market, take it from me, has not been that good. So, so the source of money for the match has gone way, way down. Uh, so there isn't as much for the state to give out. Sure. There's a, there's a, I want to ask a particular question with the CPA. There's a house on King Street. Um, it's a right across from the St. Ken Oh, yeah, that's the one we're just talking about. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, how does that work? Who owns the property? Who gets the how? Valley CDC owns it. Right. That that one and the other one they call the Maples, which is 18, which is uh, on North Maple Street, next to the hardware store. Mm -hmm. um, they. Valley CDC bought the building. We gave them, I think, $225,000 or something like that for the local portion of that as, an afford as the affordable housing money. We from, gave it to them. We gave it to them. And then they leveraged it with state and probably federal money to spend a total of $2 million creating, I think, 10 SRO rooms and a rental, commercial rental space on the first floor because that, that's commercial. Um, and they own it. and. 
the reason they give for costing so much is that, that this mechanism makes it permanently affordable because they have no debt on it. You know, for $2 million, they got a brand new building, completely funded, redone, brand new. They, they rent it, they collect the money, and because it's all paid for up front and there's no debt and it's perfect and it's new, that with its rental income it should be able to run. And, and accessible, I believe. And, and it's handicapped accessible. Yeah. Yeah. It's and, cost. And, and so, and it's very nice. Um, so, now, so that that's... For what period of time? Forever. Permanently. They own it. Oh, they own it. Valley CDC owns it. If, if, if somehow they go away. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's, it's in permanent affordability. So if they go away, another nice agency or entity would pick up the man. Assuming it's in good condition. Yeah, assuming it's in good condition. Yeah. And so is there somebody that has, is there some proviso about how that property is maintained or some kind of insurance on it? Or it is. Is not, this, not through the city. Not through the city. No. So we gave it away. We gave, we gave them $225,000. They put the rest of the funding together, did the project. They run it. It's not a city building. Okay. So they're, you know, we don't have any more to do with so it. So we, we, yeah. Okay. Free, free. So now could the same thing happen there that happened up in Florence? They did the building over up in Florence and then they came back, what, five years later and wanted another million dollars to redo it? They've done, they've done North Maple Street over a couple of times. And again, this they did it over again this time. Um, and so they've done it, they've done it a couple of times, and I suppose there's nothing to prevent them from coming back in 15 years saying our tenants trash this place and so we need more money to fix it up again. Hmm. Uh, I mean it's permanently affordable, but that doesn't mean that we'll never hear from them again because Maple Street is a perfect example of the fact that we've, we've heard from them three times. In fact, I shudder to think how much total public money has been spent on that little North Maple Street building. But now look at the Maple Street building. Or Maple Street, yeah, North. Maple. There, are there two buildings on that street? Or There's three? actually three. Yeah. Um, Across the Old Florence Inn right. is, I think, ServiceNet runs that one. Okay. And then Valley CDC has the West Building on the corner, which they recently did. And then the Maples, the, the one they call the Maples, which is the one oh, yeah. at 16 side North Maple on the other side of the Harbor Street. Okay. Yeah. So, there, so different agencies, but there's three buildings right together. So basically, hmm. if, I'm, if I'm getting the gist of this, it's not so much the fact that the, the uh, Community Preservation Act money bad thing is how it's being spent and so that would be more a function of the is there a board okay. well, they oh, oh, okay in fact uh, there's two of the the each of the the entities that's a permanent member uh, the housing authority has a person there the conservation commission has a person there the rec department has a person there the historic commission has a person there that those boards appoint and then I think the mayor has an appointment um, the council has an appointment, and then uh, two people are elected at large that will be on this ballot, and they, and they will be up running for terms. But the mayor selects a number of them. The one, I think. The mayor picks one, the council picks one, two are elected, and then the, other, the others come from those committees, housing authority, conservation, you know, the, the ones that they have to spend the money on, those boards each amongst themselves elect a, a representative from that board. And then, and sometimes they change them around, you know, this one will do it for a year and that one will do it for a year. And it's one of the areas I think the website has done a nice they, job. They, the CPA material is, is pretty well laid out. They do a really, really good job. As I said, some of the things I don't agree with, but some of the things they have to fund some of those areas. They have to fund affordable housing. And, you know, they have to fund recreation. So. They, they do it, and, but that committee is very, they have good meetings, they have good web presentation, they, you know, they're very accessible. Is, that, is the city allowed to make stipulations on giving the money for housing that would be sustainable so they wouldn't have to keep coming back? It's, it's supposed to be affordable housing, but the city, the city doesn't, you know, the city applied for money, for instance, for Forbes Library, because Forbes Library is a city entity. For historic, you know, for historic preservation of that building, but usually the housing things more often than not are private nonprofits and not the city. They're usually, you know, they may have funded, you know, a little bit of most of the stuff the city does in affordable housing comes from uh, community block grants and things of that nature. 
most of the funding that they've done through CPC has been to the CDC or other nonprofits. And, this, and, and the CDC doesn't just use it for that. They have in new home buyer counseling or first time home buyer counseling. I mean, they do other things. But the big ticket items have been that, you know, what that I've seen were the, were the Maples in Florence and the one on King Street. And yeah, that's the other thing. My question was could the city require when they give money to the group some kind of plan so that they know that they're putting money away to keep it fixed oh, up? The whole, the whole budget, uh, and that's what the CPC, the CPC committee does. The whole, the whole budget for the project is presented to them so they feel like it's viable and they want to put money into it. Okay. You know, so they see, you know, Valley CDC would have come and said, here's the entire, you know, here's our budget and prospectus for this project, here's our different funding sources, and I know when they gave them the money, it was contingent on, you know, we need to get the state grant. We, you know, they had all the other funding sources had to fall on the line. They couldn't just say, well, you know, guess what, we didn't, we didn't get the grant for this project, but we want to keep your $225,000 anyway. They couldn't have done that. And by the way, the, the LEAGUES uh, Civic Association got money from the CPA to take a look at the, the, the hotel bridge that they're trying to save. So entities like basically Village Association could of course go ahead and do that. The, the, the one, uh, uh, Childs Park got a very small one, like 6000 like bucks or something yeah. to fix a pond that had all silted in over 50 years or something. It was a very small one, but it, you know, it made a project happen. There is a forum tomorrow evening uh, on the CPA question um, over at, uh, at JFK, 7 o'clock. Um, and as you pointed out, I think the vote last time was just hundreds. It was oh, it was like under 200 yeah. votes. Yeah, under 200 vote difference. Mm -hmm. and I want to move on to the bridge, but... Oh, let me just, when we finish, yeah. if we're finishing up CPC, yeah. I did bring uh, the application if you want to be exempted from that tax altogether. And you can be. There's some income eligibility issues with that, but it's a lot more liberal than um, some of the other ones, like uh, 41C, um, the elderly ones, where you have to have very little income and very little money. Um, you can, you, you know, you can have you can have no income with a million dollars in the bank. Well, you're not going to get the elderly yeah. exemption. But for CPC, um, a single person household can make. 48.5 and get exempted from CPC. A single okay. person. A single person. Single person. Yes. And, there, and this person could make 48.5 and have a million dollars in the bank. You know, unlike the 40, 41C one where you have to have no money, no income and no money. <laughs> this one, you, you, it, it really is, is quite reasonable. So if anyone is interested in that, and by the way, if you, if you get one of the elderly exemptions for the 41 Cs, which means you have no income and no money, you automatically qualify for this one. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know if anybody here, most people that are eligible have signed up because it's been five years. So most people have, that have been, are eligible. The word is still but they have to be renewed every year, right? Um, you have to renew them, but the assessors in Northampton are very nice about that. If, you're, if you qualify, if you take the form and you go down, they'll help you fill it out. If you qualify, you'll get the exemption. And if you have to sign up every year for it, they and they know it. you, and they haven't seen you, they're, gonna, they're very nice. They'll call you and say, you know, do you come into some money or do you still need this help? All you have to is a fee come. I don't want to answer that question. So, you know, the, the assessors are they're very nice about that. If you... If you're on their list and they haven't heard from you, they'll probably hunt you up to say, you know, have you had a change in circumstances, or do you, you know, did you scratch a lottery ticket or hit Keno, or do you want it? And if you do, you got to come down and and we'll help you do your form again because uh, the 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 statutory ones are not a ton of money, but you know, it's it's money right off your tax bill, so it, it's it's meaningful to a lot of people. And the state, you know, my thought, if they do raise Social Security income, the state will probably raise the income level for the, you know, the 41C. So you, they're not going to, you're not going to, yeah, you're not going to, you're not going to, they will take into account the fact that Social Security went up and they won't uh, run, run everybody off. Um, but these are, 
But these are statutory exemptions that come from the state. The assessors just qualify you and you get them. Uh, they're not really, really huge because the amounts are set by the state. But, it, you know, every little bit helps. The, other, the only other thing I want to say about this is um, if you are about these exemptions, and, and they're here if anybody wants to look at them, um, if you are a senior and you qualify financially, you cannot pay your taxes at all. You can just stop. And you just stop paying your taxes, all right? And it goes into an account that I think, I think it's 5% interest now or something like that. For not, and, and you just never pay your taxes again. And it just stays as a lien against your house. And it can be a little surprise for your kids when you go. Because <laughs> the city's just going to collect it when your house transfers. So, it, and, and it's kind of a nice thing because it, it's not, it, it's kind of like the city's version of a reverse mortgage. You stop paying your taxes, your taxes accrue and accrue interest, but you don't have to pay them. And you have that money to, to live on. And most people's house, you know, if you bought your house for, you know, 145 and 1970. You know, it's probably worth $250,000 now. You could not pay a lot of taxes and, and not run out of money if you paid off your house. And it could be a little surprise for your kids down the road when the city says, oh, by the way, she hasn't paid her taxes in 20 years. You owe us some money. <laughs> but you keep to the house. Yeah, right. You know, here's, you get what's left. But, you know, if, you got, if you're getting a, the exemptions are, you know, between $500 and $750 off your tax bill. This is, you don't pay your tax bill at all. And if you qualify for the exemption, they take the exemption off before you defer it. So that, you know, you might save you, you know, paying, coming out of pocket to pay a bill that will ultimately be taken care of when your house is sold. Um, but, at, you know, at that point in time, um, you've had the money to live on. You haven't had to use it to pay the city. And the city gets, gets its due when... When your house and you said the interest rate on that was five percent. I think it's five percent. Yeah, I think it's five percent. Yeah, it's a, it's it's it, well, it's unlike. But if you don't pay your taxes, um, and you go in the tax title, it's like sixteen percent or so. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. Um, so it's much better to go in and you know if you're if you're income eligible to sign up uh, to just defer it, and you know if it's you know if it's Two, three, four thousand dollars a year, and if your house is worth a couple hundred grand, and you're, you're, I think, in your income and age eligible, it's never going to catch up with you, unless you live up to be 120. <laughs> I'd kind of like to move on. To okay. The, to the I just to, yeah, sure. There are four four categories. Three of the for the CPA, three of the categories are minimum 10 percent. Recreation is it can actually go by the boards and not pay. Well, Pete, speaking of maintaining things, um, in the 21 years I've been in the neighborhood, twice Clement Street Bridge has been closed. And um, after the last time it was closed, and I know there's different opinions about it. I mean, it's the greatest traffic calming, well, it's not traffic calming, but it's traffic yeah. redirecting, which is really kind of a nice thing. It's a but, social thing. Um, <laughs> we had a lovely bridge party and things, but anyhow, um, after the repair last time, it was made clear that the bridge needed regular maintenance. To, to be maintained. One of my fears is, of course, that if the bridge gives it up at some point, we'd be looking at potentially a two-lane bridge, something that would potentially bring more traffic uh, through through the neighborhood, which I wouldn't like. Um, do you know if the maintenance, if there is a maintenance schedule? Is this happening? Well, well, first of all, the bridge was closed by the state, yeah. not by the city. Like, they closed it on a Friday afternoon, as I recall. I Remember the bridge? In, where, where, where was it? it was uh, Minnesota, Minnesota, Minnesota. The bridge that fell into the river, yeah. Yeah. and somebody at the state highway department said, "Well, we got to close some bridges." And of course, they wouldn't close any in Eastern Mass. They just this was one of the ones that was on their list, and they said, "Oh, let's close that one." Who the hell's going to notice? Well, we did. You know, no one in Boston really noticed. And you'll notice it took them like actually two days to fix it. When they finally got around after a year to fixing it, they fixed it in like two days. And then they all went away from the weekend and left the lift in the middle of the bridge so you couldn't use it after they fixed it. I mean, it was a total boondoggle, just mm -hmm. awful. Um, but they have, they have done a surface study of the bridge, and they've had that for a while. Um, what is the surface? Oh, the, just the, the deck of the bridge. The, the, you know, 
Yeah, they've done a study of that and, and what it's going to take to fix it. And I have seen the study, and according to the, the, the Department of Public Works, it's not that bad. Um, I don't know, Mr. Kowalski asked me every now and then what's going on with that. And I did, when we had lunch um, Tuesday, yesterday, uh, in Florence, Jim Laurel, who's the city engineer, is in that group that meets up there because he's active in Florence Civic and Business. And I asked him about it and he said, oh yeah. I said, I know they're going to ask me about it because I can see these guys tomorrow night. What did you do with that study? And what are you doing about it? And what he said was, well, the bridge is in no immediate danger and yes, I'll dig out that study and see what it is we're supposed to do. But I don't have the answer to that question. I have a copy of the letter from the engineer, you know, but it's, you know, in engineerese about this and that and everything else, but it's, uh, according to the Jim, it doesn't, it, you know, he said the bridge is not that bad, we're okay for the moment, yes we've got the study and, and yes we're going to deal with it, but I don't know. The day the bridge was over, and I spoke to the engineers, I said, you know, the decky needs attention, that was the day it was open, and they said, yes, we're, we're looking at that. Yeah, and they did do, after they opened it, they did do the study, the study is in hand, um, it's a matter of, of doing whatever it needs. And um, I've talked to them about a couple of times, as I said, as recently as yesterday, but I haven't really got an answer from them. My fear is, is it's going to get in such disrepair mm -hmm. that it's going to become a major expense, and then they're going to get what they want, which is a concrete fridge. Um, I would, yes. um, I've been actually the last, the last two terms, I have chaired the city's capital improvement committee, which does give me some good insight on where money is, where money gets spent that is not. Uh, capital improvements is anything that's over a ten thousand dollar expense that is not contained in a department's ordinary maintenance uh, because they have personnel and OM ordinary maintenance in their in their budgets uh, and if it's over ten thousand in a capital expense it comes to this committee to prioritize it's ultimately the mayor and the finance director that make decisions but it's a committee of uh, I'm the only counselor on it but there are uh, some city department has and some citizens. I think um, usually business people. Um, Rob Osberg is on it, a financial planner. Uh, um, Bill Grinnell is on it, the insurance guy. And then a couple of department heads and, and myself and the, and the finance director. And we go through these projects. And some of the things um, that, that are on there, for instance, and we're going to talk about this later, are streets like Milton Street and Hinckley Street. Um, and by the way, uh, North Street Neighborhood Association, North Street is in the spring. It's happening. Um, it's on the books. Con Street was this, fall, was this summer. North Street's in the spring. And the engineering has been done for Hinckley Street for 10 or 15 years. I mean, it's all engineered. Um, what they do like to do, what they're going to do on North Street, what delayed North Street, is they like if they do a street and the water sewer is old and the storm sewers are old, then they like to go all the way down and do all that stuff and then put a new street on top so they don't have to dig it up again. And that's where Hinckley Street is and that's where Milton Street is. So they're not, it's not just paving it because they're going to dig the whole thing up and redo all of the, um, the infrastructure underneath it so they don't have to go back in there for a while. And often the gas company comes and does new gas pipes. And then it's a good street for a long time. Woodlawn Avenue was next time. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Woodlawn Avenue is awful. Well, but you notice whenever, like the gas company has been over there. And that's always a good sign. The gas yes, company yes. has now done their line. You know, so you do water and sewer and then you find a <coughs> way to surface it. Um, the also, one, for what about the bridge? The bridge? <laughs> uh, the bridge? Well, the bridge would be... The reason I meant the reason I got here was the bridge would be a capital improvement request, you know, unless the state funded it, you know, and took it out of our hands, we'd have to put money aside for well, that. Well, when I talked to Jim about this, he was very happy about that because the state was willing to take over if they put if they could put in their concrete bridge, mm -hmm. the state would assume responsibility. And go, oh, hallelujah! But that's yeah, but we, we don't. We didn't. And when you think about the carnage that that would create over there. Because the state standards is not going to like an approach that's like a ski jump. And they're not, I mean, you would not recognize that part of town. Not to mention, the environmental permitting for that would be outrageous. 
it would be outrageous. So, uh, and this, remember the state or the rocket scientists that shut it for a year, then worked on it for two days, and when it was ready to open, left for a long weekend and left the equipment in the middle of the bridge so you can drive it. It's the same thing that happened to Chicken. They ordered yeah. the wrong piece of beam, so yeah. they had the reef. And in Springfield, you'll notice the South End Bridge yes. was in the paper the other day where they blocked off a lane and then stopped working on it for three months. There was no reason to leave the lane blocked off. They just did for three months. Well, I mean, somebody wrote one letter and, and, and it got published. And, 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 and they took the all the calls away. Yeah, it, so I'd rather they not get involved in it. Because <laughs> uh, they have done some projects for us. Um, the people, you know, the, the roundabout was their project in Bible Park. That was, they engineered that. They did the intersection um, at North Maple and Bridge Road. They did that intersection. Um, and they're looking at doing Damon Road, uh, North King, that doing over that intersection as part of, you know, they've been talking about putting some more exits on 91 by the Coolidge Bridge and redoing that whole thing. So they do, they do stuff like that. And Route 66 was their project. And in fact, George Andropides liked to say, when he got hired in the DPW, he was told his first project would be do, redoing West Hampton Road, Route 66. And he actually retired before the state ever did. So he did a whole career and retired before the state ever did anything out there. So what do we think to get the bridge moving along? Um, I truly think that the, the thing it needs in short term is the resurfacing of it, you know, to do the deck. Yeah. And they have a study for that. Um, they got to bid it and do it and bring it to capital improvements. Now capital improvements usually meets the budget, the fiscal year is July 1 to June 30. We usually start capital improvements um, right after the first year. We start meeting maybe in February to come up with what projects. And projects and capital improvements tend to be, you know, a new roof on a school, a uh, new furnace for a school. Um, a lot of the stuff that we had that was deferred capital improvements, energy related, got run in, rolled into this ESCO project that we just did, like $6 million worth of improvements for energy savings. And the energy saving, the company that did it, um, that, that's in charge of administering it, guarantees us the savings. So we bonded like $6 million, spent it on windows and furnaces and light fixtures and all that sort of thing. And they guarantee us the savings that they put forward, we get. So if we don't get that a level of savings, they have to make it up. And they're just finishing, they've been like 13 months working on the construction, 14 months, so they're just about done with that. So that took a lot of things off the table. But it's, it, it's, it's schools come in for, for work uh, on their buildings. Um, the police, the, the new police department was part of this. Um, they got, most of it got funded through the override, but that was in, the, in that budget. Um, so those sorts of things come along, and DPW would bring that bridge along as one of their projects. The other thing we do intend to do relative to road construction is try and do um, a five-year bonding for doing roads and roll it over, you know, commit that, uh, the payment on that bond so that we can do more than one road a year because the, the, the chapter 90 money that comes to us from the Registry of Motor Vehicles for, for working on roads isn't enough to do a road. It's, you know, Six to nine hundred thousand dollars a year. And you can't do con. You can do con street. What they did on con street for that kind of money. So this would this the prospect of this is a five year bond that we'd roll over every five years and it'd be paid off in five years and we'd start another one just to do streets. So where should we make noise? I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, and in my mind too, the the, the the surface is one thing. The substructure is why it got closed. So that's what needs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and this, but in that instance, the substructure was two days' work. It really didn't justify shutting it for a year. Sure, sure. That, sure. Was, the, that was the state. You won't tell anybody else. Yeah. But in terms of the maintenance, that, that doesn't rust out again. And that kind uh, of thing. Yeah, and as I understand it, the thing they needed to do was the deck of the bridge. They've got the engineering. I think, I don't remember if they did it or not, but they didn't feel it was going to be that expensive. Um, good, good. So good. maybe we can get it done, and that the bridge. I'll you know I'll take responsibility for bugging them about the bridge because I have continued to ask them about it as recently as Tuesday. Um, so I'll keep after them for the bridge, and there is a pecking order for streets. North Street's next, but Milton Street and 
Hinkley Street are on the list. Um, the one thing with Milton Street that is going to come up is how do we fix that awful intersection? Yeah. How do you do that with Milton Street? I mean with Elm. With, with Elm and Riverside. Yeah. And that, your head, you have to, your head has to go 360 degrees to try and see to pull out there. So I think when they do Milton Street, they're going to try and figure out how can we re-engineer that intersection to make it safer, So those, because the angles are terrible. The other thing, and I don't know whether you recall this or not, but I believe it was Valley CDC was looking to put some more housing on Milton Street, you know, where the wooded area is behind those other apartment complexes. Right? The reason the project was dropped was the DPW said we do not have sufficient water and sewer at that location to serve more housing. Okay, when they do Milton Street, that's going to solve that problem. So you might well find that infill, that infill, and sustainability and infill, and all, that's going to come back when they do that street. Mark my words. So. So we need to keep after you regarding the bridge maintenance. <laughs> yeah, I'll take the bridge maintenance because I, yeah, the bridge maintenance and fixing the Milton Street Riverside, you know, I bug every time I see Mr. Hunt, he's like, yeah, I know, we've got to fix that intersection. Which yeah. is another, I know Laura Henson has worked yeah. on that intersection yeah. as well in yeah. terms of the whole traffic. Problem. And it, you know, it's tough because that's the primary access to the parking lot. So there's high schools, yeah. so there's a lot of young drivers going through that really nasty intersection every day. And when they fix, you know, when they take care of the natural traffic coming on Milton Street by paving it, then it's going to be even faster. So the concept is how can you turn them and tee them into Riverside or something so they're not attacking that intersection with a lot of gusto. Uh, and that's, that's what probably will, will delay Milton Street a little is just the engineering, re-engineering of that intersection, getting that squared away so it's safer. I avoid that intersection coming down. Oh, yeah. I go down well, nothing and then down. Yeah, they, they can get one way, so they have to come out either. Yeah, because they can go to Ormond, they can get out of Ormond, or they can go on the other way. Presumably, yeah. Ormond will be fixed at the same time that the other street is. They're equally awful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're, uh, well, I'm sure when Laura looks at it, it's going to be. You don't want to, when you fix one thing, you don't want to defer people to a worse intersection. You know, so you, you don't, you want to take a look at where the traffic would go if you, you know, if you turn Milton Street and tee it into Riverside, far, you know, so that there's only one street intersecting. Uh, how do you do that? And, and if somebody wants to avoid it, where do they end up going? And so Ormond, they probably would do that at the same, the same time they're there. Where, where's that housing on Milton, is that at the corner of Milton? And no, no, it's, it's if you go down, it's past the school field on the right, there's some woods there. Yeah. You know there's a, apartments on, on Riverside Drive, and if you go, there's like, the little, they're little mushroomy looking yeah. apartment, you know, yeah. Brown, yeah. 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 Right, well, if the, there's woods behind that that go all the way through to Milton Street. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. There, okay. there was a proposal to do some housing in there, but it, it didn't move because there wasn't enough infrastructure in Milton Street to connect it to. But once they redo the infrastructure in Milton What's Street... What's happening to the corner there, that lot? Uh, Where the trees are Oh, that, that belongs to a private, that belongs right. to the wire works. Right. That's where I'd rather see the uh, apartment. Yeah. 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 Um yeah. But because I, I, J.J. Smith sold that property, I guess, for that apartment mm -hmm. to go in there. And he didn't, nobody communicated with his neighbors about this. Mm -hmm. And some of his neighbors were quite upset with yeah. the whole process. And, and it will, um, but that that will come back when that street gets done and the infrastructure is there. And we have not dealt with, you know, you've heard all the zoning, not that it relates here, but they've started on King Street. They, you know, we will we'll come to council before the end of the year to redo the zoning on King Street by Stop and Shop and also to redo it between um, where the this, this looks like a sophisticated crowd that would remember where Clyde Ford was, right? Yes. Yeah. People, when, you, when, when you're downtown, you have to say the old Honda garage, because nobody remembers Clyde Ford downtown. But from there down, it'll be a different zone, and it's a new zone that they've created right for there. But then, 
you know, remember from sustainability, then we're going to go and start to go through uh, the, the residential zones looking to do sustainable infill. And that, the infill is wonderful on paper, but it's not wonderful when it lands next to you. And that, and that we're going to discover when we get around to that. So, yeah. we, well, we, we, we like to try and finish about 8.30, it's just about that. You get, uh, we'll go back to your list, I can be kind of freelancing. And, and, well, we've hit on every, we didn't hit on the school too much, mm -hmm. but we, we, I think we, we did manage to, to say some stuff about the school and the budgeting. And how well, and, and the schools, you know, your Ms. Pick, the Ward 5 school committee person, is that, the, you know, it, it's the school committee member that's the chair, the mayor by charter chairs it, but she's the vice chair. So she's, you know, the second most powerful person on the school committee. And as I said earlier, we give them, the mayor puts them in the budget. All we can do is hurt them by cutting them, so we generally don't do that. But every dime they get, they spend the way they want to, and we don't have any line items saying that. So well, a lot of that is wages, though. Oh, yeah. Um, a lot of it is, th that's the largest portion of it is wages. You know, because they, they have, they're the, the largest employer the yeah, department so in the city. They're cutting people or cutting their salaries or something, there's no way they can really And one thing, that. one thing I would say that they have started to do, though, because this comes to us, they have started to try and put other educational uses in some of the schools. Can remember there was talk about, gee, you know, maybe we got one too many elementary school because we got empty classrooms. Well, they put some Head Start program classes at Ryan Road School that they get income for. So they're trying to fill up that school uh, year to year with now Head Start classrooms for younger kids to help help them out and fill the school. And I think Leeds School is doing some autism, an autism classroom. And one of the schools, it may be Leeds as well, is partnering on something with Clark School for a hearing, for a hearing impaired classroom. So they are, I give them credit for the fact that they are doing, yeah. using some of their empty space for ancillary educational purposes to fill their buildings up and try and make a little money, you know, because they're there and they're, they're operating the buildings. Um, the, other, the other thing that happened with them this year is they got a brand new school superintendent and they got a brand new finance director. And from all accounts, the... Uh, these, the, the, the school superintendent came from a school finance background and they think very highly of the new finance director that they got and the city finance director moved over from school, Susan Wright. And she's, we had finance committee meeting before we came here tonight, we had city finance. And she's been great for that because Chris had done it for a long time. She's doing it for her first year. She used to be a town manager, I guess at Whaley or something. She used to do everything for Whaley. But she's going through the whole process and has become very good at explaining what she's doing. Chris kind of just took it for granted, but Susan has been explaining what she's up to, writing some very nice reports for the counselors as to what's going on, going on with her. And she's very good. So hopefully that will, the financial side of the schools will be will be more public in their meetings and, and more transparent. Uh, you know, Susan did a great job, but I must say I wasn't, I wasn't that keen on our former superintendent's management style when it came to finances. Um, but this superintendent seems to be on top of it. And from what I can tell, he's gotten right into it with the union, you know, getting the teacher, he's working on their contracts. And so I think they're feeling more attention now than they have before, so hopefully that will help. I yeah, go interject on this whole round Quick. school stuff. <laughs> um, who, Chris Mason has, mm -hmm. has been sort of taking the lead on the... On He's the, the energy guy. The, yeah. Thank you. Uh, the, the ESCO thing. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the school. That is in the schools too. And Smith right. Boat as well. They've seen a lot. So these, these places have been trying to reduce their energy mm -hmm. usage. That's the first mm -hmm. approach. Who pays the... the energy. Is that out of the school budget or it's, is that out of the city budget? The all the energy now is in the central services department that David Pomerantz runs. But it's budgeted, central services administers it, but you know, it's heat money for Smith Folk, it's heat money for Ryan Road School, it's heat money. So it's 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 budgeted um, 
through central services. The central services keeps track of it. And when central services, central services is going to collect the energy savings because of the ESCO money out of the various budgets and use it to pay the bond. So, right. so when, in fact, David was at finance tonight to talk about that. So he, um, central services manages the facilities for the school and central services is going to collect the savings from all of the different buildings from all the different departments and then use that money to pay the bond and keep track of how much they save and so forth. So why can't we take that one step further mm -hmm. and um, go with uh, energy generation systems, portable takes is the first time I have to last, mm -hmm. and uh, use that, take a bond, mm -hmm. get a bond to, to pay for the photovoltaics, use the energy savings from the photovoltaics to pay off that bond. I mean, it's the same thing oh, as what you're doing we've with done, We've savings. done that in two places. There's a huge photovoltaic thing in Smith Oak now. Remember right. where the tennis courts were in your paper? Yeah. Or it's, it's, yeah. The tennis yeah. courts are gone and there's a huge photovoltaic array there, a giant, giant thing. And where did the money come from for, for that, though, the, for the photovoltaics at, at Smith Oak? That was bonded. Okay. So, we got this wonderful bond rating in this city. The interest rates are about as low as they're going to be. Um, oh, and, the, and the, the, the savings is used for that. The other place we have put photovoltaic is on the James House. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of photovoltaic well, on that that we put in. The, the reason I'm asking this is there was a question at one of the uh, counselors at large meeting about using the dump site for a photovoltaic. Mm -hmm. Uh, site. Now there's some engineering guesses that there might be some settling and things like mm -hmm. that. But there's a lot of yeah. buildings around mm -hmm. that have roofs and things that could use mm -hmm. this. And why not grab that bond money while the interest rates are low, while we have a good bond rating, use the savings to pay off that bond, and then from then on, you're you're ahead of the game yeah. and not tied to the whims of the inflation. What we did just do was change Northampton zoning to permit large-scale photovoltaic. You've been able to put it on the on your house if you wanted to, but for instance, we changed it to make it easier in various locations in the city. Uh, the planning board wanted to retain some site plan review just so they had some control over somebody putting a bunch of these things in. The one place it would be very easy to put it is at the airport because they've got a lot of open space around the runways and stuff where they could put it and it's not going to bother anybody if it's at the airport because you know nobody lives at the airport as they say. Joe Gennaro said that right? Nobody lives at the airport. Um, but the other thing we're doing, and I think you'll find this kind of interesting, is this would, and, and there's a little more federal work to be done, but what we're trying to do is, is set up a bond where we do a bond, and then we loan the money to okay. residents yeah. to do energy, you know, energy saving photovoltaic projects at their home. Now, photovoltaic is expensive, and sometimes if you if you went to like your bank, you may not be able to get a long enough term to make it pay itself back. You know, they may say, well, we want to do this over a five year. You know, this is like a little home improvement loan, five years or something. Well, the energy savings won't pay it back on that short of scale. So what the city would do is float a bond and lend you the money, and then you would make a payment on your tax bill, like a, like in, in for me with betterment assessment, like mm -hmm. all right, where we build your. You, we used to see it a lot when when they did the big sewer project down the Connecticut River Valley from you know, they they put this in and you pay it on your tax bill till it was paid off, and we're trying to do that now where we'd float a bond, have an energy fund, you as a citizen could, you know, go out for 15 years with us to put photovoltaic on your property. You'd get billed on your tax bill uh, for it. And so the, the, it's possible, one of the things they're working at at the federal level is with, you know, with, the, uh, with Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, that they would permit this to be another lien on the property. Uh, the, that's something at the federal level that I think Congress is working on straightening out now. And then we just have to figure out how to administer it. You know, they, we'd have to build, because we don't want to, you, you don't want to have everybody paying to administer something that only a few people use. So when we figure out the interest rate, there's got to be enough money in there to pay for the administration of the whole thing. But that, I, I suspect, will happen sometime in the next year or two, where you'll be able to 
borrow the money essentially from the city energy fund, do photovoltaic on your house, or maybe wind on your house. There's a, a company in East Hampton making nice little five and ten kilowatt box style turbine style generators, uh, or something like that on your house, and pay it off, you know, quarterly on your tax bill, and it's attached to your house, so. If you don't pay, we'll get the money eventually. I was I was referring back to the city doing that for its own sake. Well, we already and the schools and, and boosting that up another notch, though. I mean, yeah, right? and that's kind a of lot of that was wrapped into the ESCO, which we and which six million dollars worth of that kind of stuff is now happening. So, uh, in addition, the photovoltaic at Smith, and there's a lot of photovoltaic on on the James House, and we'll only do more do more of that, but. We took a six million dollar bite in energy savings in the last, you know, 13, 14 months. It's really, it's really happening. Peter, at current technology, they have a life speed. Mm -hmm. So there's a depreciation at which you don't recoup, mm -hmm. and you, they have to be replaced. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not a forever thing. It's not a no. free lunch forever. No, and the the savings, um, the savings of it. The recapture is longer than, you know, as I said, traditional loans. But eventually, I mean, you remember all the, the low tech ones from the 70s. Most people ripped those off their roofs by now and got rid of them. Were those humongous giant water heaters that. The only question we didn't get to, if I can just get us, because um, it's probably the time to about finish here, was if you're supporting somebody for mayor, um, and I wondered if, uh, and if you had any closing thing you'd like to say, David. Um, and when we're done, do we, we want everybody to drink what's left to drink and that's you know, more what of cookies are left to eat? Yeah, yeah, that coffee is decaf. <laughs> so, if anybody's wondering. Well, I, I, am, I am supporting David Narkowitz for mayor. I, we came on the council together. David, Maureen, and myself came on together with the 2005 election. I've worked very closely with him. Uh, he's a good guy. And when, you know what I think about it. If, if you, he, to me, really is changed. He's new, hasn't been around forever. Uh, he's, you know, I will tell you he's going places. He's not going to be mayor forever because he's going to try and move up in politics and run for something else, which leads me to believe he's probably going to want to do a good job because he's going to, you know, I have no trouble with stepping stones if it means you're going to do a good job and you're going to move on. And I think it's helpful, you know, to have the mayor's office. We've had like, two mayors that have gobbled up over 20 years between them. Mayor, you know. It's hard to imagine. I think Dave left in the 80s, didn't he? I mean, he did. He Mary, between Mary Ford and Mary Claire, there's almost 20 to 25 years between the two of them. So to have a mayor that moves along is maybe not such a bad thing. And, and uh, as I said, I get along with him. I get along with Michael too, and I wouldn't have any trouble working with either of them. I just think you know, David really is more of a change from the old to the new. And uh, um, as I said, I. I, because he's my classmate and we came on together and worked yeah. together, it's, it, I'm, he's, he's the one I'm, I'm supporting. Um, and no, no, we talked about pretty much most of the things that 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 I think are that I think are current. The only thing we didn't get to that you will see come up is flood control um, slash stormwater, because yeah. it's stormwater. Well, it's flood control for the people. Uh, on Willow Street and the people on, on uh, Federal Street down at the bottom of the hill, you know, where, and, and it's flood control for, for uh, the ball field and, you know, places that it floods. But it's stormwater for everybody else because, you know, it, that, it gets from the stormwater system to the flood control system. And we need to, in the not too distant future, I think it's recertify as the term, but our, the dike system that the Army Corps put, engineers put in after the 30s flood, um, we, we just, with capital improvements, replaced one of the pumps that's original uh, down there because you couldn't get parts for it anymore because the company doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're doing that. But that whole dike system needs to be recertified or whatever you call it. And if they're, if they're not recertified, then the FEMA takes them off the map and says, you know, the, this is protecting this portion of Northampton. So if they take those away, 
suddenly everybody in that contour needs flood insurance. And so we, this is kind of, hasn't been real public yet. We've talked about it in capital improvements and DPW's talked about it. But we need to prepare for that. So we got to work on the collection system. They've just done a big stormwater study that should be in at any point now. So part of it's collecting the stormwater from around the city and getting it in an orderly manner down to the pumping stations by the wastewater treatment plant to get it out because we have we have to pump it out of the city when the river's high because it won't gravity feed because the river's above where where the stormwater system is um, and then get the dike system recertified the cost to the city would be greater to the individual people would be greater I think if they all got, had to pay flood insurance than it would be to collectively make it right and it's not uh, something that we've paid a lot of attention to or spent a lot of money on, but we need to. So it's either you're either out in the storm, the, the the stormwater collection area part of the city, or the flood control. You'd really flood if this happens. So it's kind of everybody's problem: how to get it from here to here, how to get it out of here, and not have it come back in the, in the form of the river flooding. Uh, so that that's probably the only thing that's out there that really hasn't gotten a lot of press. And so it's kind of everybody's problem, whether you're on the collection end or the get it out of the city, get protected by the dike end. So that will be coming along um, and trying to find a way to fund that. But I think everything else. Does right. that feed into your fill-in problem? I mean, this idea of filling in no. create, estimates the whole problem. Mm -hmm. Because you don't have a place for that to go and there's no natural mm -hmm. way to restrain or detain that water. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, you know, absolutely, and I think that's, it has to go somewhere, and I think it was really apparent with the tropical storm in Vermont, you know, we're, the Northampton Meadows, the valley, is sort of the natural flood control system for what happens upriver. We've got places where the water makes field. I mean, that's where the river spreads out so it doesn't get into people's houses, you know, so it's got places to spread out the natural reservoir until the volume goes down. And Vermont, because it's all like this, doesn't have those, so they just get wiped out when something like this happens, because there's no place for the water to spread out like it does down here. Um, and we, you know, for better or worse, downtown Northampton, lots of Ward 3 and Ward 4 got built where the river normally did that. And it's not like we could just say, well, okay, we'll just, you know, you guys are all going to move now and we're going to just let the river do this, whatever it does it you still have to protect those places because they were there. Um, but it is efficiently getting the water from point A to point B and getting it out of the city without it flooding anybody. And that, the, the, the study will be in this spring, should, you know, some point soon, it will come up on the agenda in springtime. And then we'll have to figure out what's going to cost to fix it. And it really does need to be fixed because you can't, what would happen, you know, because next to my office on Con Street, the house has a sign up at the sill that's at the soffit that says 1938. Well, you know, you know, all of that part of town. Very proudly displayed. Too. Very proudly. <laughs> and uh, so there really isn't an option not to recertify the dike system and work on the stormwater because. Does that mean that there'll be more storm sewers built because they're they're intermittent? They're not in super good shape, okay. and, and not, you know, it's not it's not a you know. A perfect example, we come to a meeting like this and funding the schools is always on the topics, but not what to do with the storm sewers. And so it's not a it's not the sort of thing that people have bake sales for the storm sewers. But they take them really seriously when their ba their their basement fills up with water. It's just like any other Yeah, it's like yeah, it's it's tough when the basement fills up with water. So we do have this we do have to spend money on it and it isn't a flashy sort of, you know, Thing that people come to council and speak about until something bad happens, and we've sort of taken the system for granted since the 40s, uh, but we do have to do some work on it. Or big chunks of the city are going to be having to pay flood insurance and, and in trouble, and you know, it's sort of a collective issue. Whether you're collecting it or pumping it, it's coming from somewhere. For the individual, it's very pricey. Oh, oh it is. Yeah, uh, we see that. You know, and you see that a lot. We belong, Northampton belongs to the FEMA flood insurance program. And you probably saw some stuff in the news about the fact that Congress was diddling around with were they going to refund it or not. 
they really have to refund it because Northampton belongs to it. If the city belongs, you get the discounted FEMA insurance, but you don't need it if you're protected by the flood control dike because you're not in a flood zone because the map contour doesn't have you there. But if they erase the dike, the number of people would have to pay it would be astronomical. And it's, um, you know, it's hundreds of dollars a year per parcel. And you can't get a mortgage without it. I mean, you have to pay it. There's no way to say, well, I'll take the risk. If you got a mortgage, you've got to pay the flood insurance. And we, uh, I can tell you, every appraisal my guys do, they want a flood map, they want the FEMA flood panel, and they want the FEMA flood zone every time we do an appraisal for mortgage purposes. And they, you just, no, 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 if you're in a flood zone, no insurance, no mortgage. And so it's that major. And you can't have half of downtown's commercial real estate unmortgageable or unfinanceable because it's going to go underwater. It's, it's, not, it's not an economic reality. So, But it's not like on the agenda like, you know, the schools are, or, you know, some other things. But we're going to have to go there. So. Thanks, David, so much. Thanks. We've covered a lot of territory. Yeah, um, November 15 is our traffic meeting. Well, we'll work on getting the word out to get, uh, get people out. Well, so well. you said November 14th before. Uh, yeah, I looked at my calendar. Tuesday, November 15th. Bring a laptop. So 15? Yeah. We can send all the emails and that Send them all. Just, yeah, take your turn. Yeah. But it's a good time. Everybody say that. Well, first actually, time. this is even better because Laura, I mean, I forward the emails to, to Maureen, who's the chair of the committee. Laura's on the committee. So she comes and does outreach here, right? She's the one to talk to. You know, you can just hand write a note and give it to her, and she'll take it. And it's that she is really very, very nice. You've, worked, you've talked to her. Oh, she's yeah. Very nice. She was very done thorough. Her here before. And she mm -hmm. knows her. She knows her traffic and you know her engineering. So while we were handing out at the uh, the forums we had and before I had three different things to do. One was to write write letters to various people. One was to come to the next the meeting on the fifteenth, and the third one. It loses me at the moment, but um, that's uh, I emailed that around several times. It's on the website. Talk as well. to our counselor, wasn't it? Uh, that would have his, no. his email was on the list. Yeah, yeah no, I'm happy. I'm happy to forward them. But if, if you're hot on it, um, come see Laura, and she said, I mean, she's and she's a, an engineer in addition to doing traffic. I mean, she was she was working. She was the one most of the time that was monitoring the construction crew on Constant. You know, because that's part of her traffic duty. So she was there, watched them say, no, 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 do it this way. You know, so she's very good, and she does real, you know, engineering work. She's not just somebody collecting emails. She really gets out there and chases the contractors around. So she's a good person, and if she's coming here, come and see her. This, yeah. this very space. Okay, don't on November 15th. That's yeah, right. you can just bring her a handwritten note. You don't have to send an email. Just bring her a handwritten note. Hand it to her, and she'll she'll take it. She's she's very very nice. So do eat some cookies. Everybody <laughs> <laughs> wave 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 to Adams. Wave, wave to the <laughs> Thank you, Emily. <laughs> <laughs>